فاشرف بي لاشتغال بالعلم ولا تبغي به ما عشت يا ذا بدلا ويا له من شرف عظيم فصل في استحباب الاستعادة فإذا أراد الشروع في القراءة استعاد فقال أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم هكذا قال الجمهور من العلماء وقال بعض السلف يتعوذ بعد القراءة لقوله تعالى فإذا قرأت القرآن فاستعد بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وتقدير الآية عند الجمهور فإذا أردت القراءة فاستعد ثم صفة التعوذ كما ذكرنا وكان جماعة من السلف يقولون أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم ولا بأس بهذا ولكن الاختيار هو الأولى ثم إن التعوذ مستحب ليس بواجب وهو مستحب لكل قارئ سواء كان في الصلاة أو غيرها ويستحب في الصلاة في كل ركعة على الصحيح من الوجهين عند أصحابنا وعلى الوجه الثاني إنما يستحب في الركعة الأولى فإن تركه في الأولى أتى به في الثانية ويستحب التعوذ في التكبيرة الأولى ويستحب التعوذ في التكبيرة الأولى من صلاة الجنازة على أصح الوجهين Section Section Seeking refuge The author here رح, رحمه الله now talks about that it's recommended to say أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم when reading the Quran نعم The reciter must seek refuge from shaitan before he starts his recitation and on this, the majority of scholars are agreed. If a person intends to read the Quran, he says his isti'adha, and he says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan rajim This is the opinion and the view held by the majority of the scholars. And some of the salaf, they said, some of the pious predecessors, they said. Some, however, are of the opinion that the reciter should seek refuge after completing his after completing his recitation because Allah says and when you recite the Quran seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan the outcast some scholars took the ayah at its apparent meaning which is that Allah says in the ayah فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ if you have read the Quran so that's a past tense you've already read the Quran فَاسْتَعِدْ بِاللَّهِ seek refuge in Allah from what? مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ but some of the scholars they said that there's a taqdeer Taqdeer here meaning there's something that's within the verse that's not, that's basically there. Which is, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ أَيْ فَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ قِرَاءَةَ الْقُرْآنِ If you intend to recite the Qur'an. So the word أَرَدْتَ is in there. It's مُقَدَّر. صح? It's مُقَدَّر. So that's why the author mentions it. Huh? However, most scholars have interpreted this verse to mean that if one intends to read the Qur'an, he must first seek refuge with Allah from Shaitan, the Al-Qas, and not one Does that make sense? So some of the scholars, they inter- they <coughs> their interpretation is that فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ أَيْ فَإِذَا أَرَدْتَ الْقِرَاءَةَ If you intend to read the Qur'an فَاسْتَعِدْ بِاللَّهِ سِيكْ رَفِيْجِ إِنَّ اللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ And some say, no, we take the ayat and it's apparent. So what it means is that the أعوذ بِاللَّهِ is after the recitation. We have already mentioned one means of seeking refuge. And some among the pious predecessors used to say, I seek refuge with Allah, the all hearing, the all knowing from Shaitan, the outcast. So some of the Salaf, they used to say um, that you should add the word, وَأَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ السَّمِيعِ الْعَلِيمِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ So they, had to add, they added this extra, le- extra two wordings, which is, السَّمِيعِ الْعَلِيمِ The reason is because they got it from the ayah, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ الْقُرْآنَ فاستعد بالله من الشيطان الرجيم. ها؟ huh? They got it from the ayah. What is it? What's the hadith they took it from? Huh? 
the hadith of Prophet took it. But I thought there was an ayah in the Quran they took it from. What was it? Huh? 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 Um, something. There was an ayah, eh? While this manner is acceptable, the first manner, i.e., to say, I seek refuge in Allah from Shaitan, the outcast, is better. While seeking refuge is recommended, it is not it is not obligatory. And it is recommended that the reciter seek refuge whether he is reciting in his prayers or outside of that. So it's not wajib to say it, he says. To seek refuge in Allah from the shaitan is not obligatory, it's recommended. And it is recommended for every reciter, whether he is, the, is in salah or whether he's outside the salah. It doesn't matter. Naam. Yeah? وَإِن مَا يَزَّغَنَّكَ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ نَزْغٌ فَاسْتَعِدْ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ إِنَّهُ سَمِعُ الْعَلِيمِ That is the Samir Al-Alim. Yeah? That's where that's where he got it. That's that's where they got it from. Does that make sense? She's saying to you, sharing is caring, Ibrahim. Give me your crisp. Share. Stop eating it by yourself. She likes people to share. So how do you hear? Yeah. So while seeking refuge is recommended, it's not obligatory. Recited to seek refuge whether he's reciting in his prayers or outside of that. Mm -hmm. Is it also recommended that the reciter seek refuge in every rak'ah while reciting in prayer according to the more correct of the two opinions held by our companions? So that every rak'ah. Some scholars actually said it's obligatory. It is what? It is obligatory to read the isti'adha because Allah says, فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ فَإِذَا قَرَأْتَ فَاسْتَعِذْ بِاللَّهِ فاستعد بالله من الشيطان الرجيم فاستعد seek refuge in Allah come on and a command shows what obligation, obligation. some scholars they said that some said no is this tihbab is recommended where did they get that from that when the Prophet was teaching al the one who was whose salah was bad the Prophet didn't say فاستعد بالله so this is a sarif that diverts it The other opinion is that it is obligatory only in the first rak'ah. And should one forget to seek refuge in the first rak'ah, he should do so in the second rak'ah. Some scholars, they said that he does in every rak'ah, and other scholars, they said, no, it doesn't have to be in every single rak'ah. All that is enough is that the person does it from the first time they pray. Allahu Akbar. So they, so they make the dua, they say, and they read, and then they read Surah Al Fatiha, they don't have to do it again. Huh. It is also recommended to seek the author says, Fasrun fil muhafadati ala al basmana wa fil ala al basmana wa yambari ayu hafid ala kirati bismillahi rahman rahim fi awali kuli suratin siwa baraa fa inna akthar al ulama i kalu innaha ayatun haythu kutibat innaha ayatun haythu haythu kut إنها آية حيث كتبت في المصحف وقد كتبت في أوائل السور سوى براءة فإن قرأها كان متيقنا, متيقنا قراءة الختمة أو السورة وإذا أخل بالبسملة كان تاركا لبعض القرآن عند الأكثرين فإن كانت القراءة في وظيفة عليها جعل كالأسباع والأجزاء التي عليها أوقاف وأزراق وأرزاق كالأسباع والأجزاء التي عليها أوقاف وأرزاق كان الاعتناء بالبسملة أشد ليستحق ما يأخذه يقينا 
فإنه إذا أخل به لم يستحق شيئا من الوقف عند من يقول عند من يقول البسملة من أوائل السور وهذه دقيقة وهذه دقيقة نفيسة يتأكد الاعتناء بها وإشاعتها One should always say Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim at the beginning of each surah, except Surah At-Tawbah. So the author now goes into making sure that the person is always saying the Bismillah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. And the person he says needs to make sure that they save God and they are always reading the Bismillah in the beginning of every surah, other than Surah Al-Bara'ah. Now. The majority of scholars are of the opinion that it is a verse <coughs> that it is written at the beginning of each surah in the Mus'haf except at the beginning of Surah Al-Bara'ah. The majority of the scholars hold the opinion that the Bismillah is an ayah, it's a verse in the Quran, it's a verse. And it's written in what? At the beginning of every surah except Surah Tawbah. He called it Bara'ah. And this is the norms that some scholars do, that they name the surah based on the beginning of the surah. Sah? They'll name the surah the beginning of it, instead of calling it by what? Instead of by calling, instead of calling it by the name of what the surah is. So surah to bara'a, does it have a basmala? Some scholars they said that it's. It's basically joint with Surah Al-Anfal. It's just one Surah. Some scholars. There's khilafat, there's discussions going on. Now. But Thus, if the reciter says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, also known as the Basmala, he will have affirmed the correct recitation of the Quran or, given it, or a given chapter. But if he leaves it out, then he has left out a part of the Quran according to the majority of the scholars. If a wage or endowment is being paid for a job that involves the recitation of the Qur'an, such as those that request that one-seventh or some chapters of the Qur'an be recited, it is more emphatically recommended that the basmala be uttered so that the, so that the reciter can, be, can rest assured that he is fully deserving of that which he is being paid. So if, a, if, if a people come and they ask the, a person to read Qur'an for them, and they say, this is the portion we want you to read, and we're going to pay you for it, okay? They pay him for it. Are you with me, brothers and sisters? And he misses the best mala, he has not done the job. If he's of the opinion that the best mala is an ayah from the Quran. Those holding the view that the best mala is a verse and must be recited hold the opinion that the reciter who leaves it out is not deserving of anything he was supposed to be paid for his recitation. This is a valuable and rather intricate ruling that should be regarded as important and made known. This is something he's trying to say that many people are heedless about. So we should, <coughs> we should know that. فصل في تدبر القرآن والخشوع عند القراءة فإذا شرع في القراءة فليكن شانه الخشوع والتدبر عند القراءة والدلائل عليه أكثر من أن تحصر وأشهر وأظهر من أن تذكر فهو المقصود والمطلوب وبه تنشرح الصدور وتستنير القلوب قال الله عز وجل أفلا يتدبرون القرآن وقال تعالى كتاب أنزلناه إليك مبارك ليدبروا آياته وليتذكر أولو الألباب والأحاديث فيه كثيرة وأقاويل السلف فيه مشهورة وقد بات جماعة من السلف يتلو يتلون آية واحدة يتدبرونها ويرددونها إلى الصباح وقد صعق جماعات من السلف عند القراءة ومات جماعة منهم حال القراءة وقد روينا عن بهز بن حكيم أن زرارة بن أوف التابعي الجليل 
أن زرارة بن عوف التابعي الجليل رضي الله عنه أمهم في صلاة الفجر فقرأ حتى إذا بلغ فإذا نقر في الناقور فذلك يومئذ يوم عسير خر ميتا قال بهز فكنت في من حمله وكان أحمد بن أبي وكان أحمد بن أبي الحواري رضي الله عنه وهو ريحانة الشام كما قال أبو القاسم الجنيد رحمه الله تعالى إذا قرئ عند القراءة إذا قرئ عنده القرآن يصيح ويصعق قال ابن أبي داود وكان القاسم بن عثمان الجويعي رحمه الله تعالى ينكر ذلك على ابن أبي الحواري وكان, الجو وكان الجوعي فاضلا من محدثي أهل دمشق يقدم في الفضل على ابن, على ابن أبي الحواري قال وكذلك أنكره أبو, الجو أبو الجوزاء وقيس بن بحتر وغيرهما وقلت والصواب عدم الإنكار إلا على من اعترف بأنه يفعل تصنعا والله تعالى أعلم وقال السيد الجليل ذو الموائب والمعارف إبراهيم الخواص رضي الله عنه دواء القلب خمسة أشياء قراءة القرآن بالتدبر وخلاء البطن وقيام الليل والتضرع والتضرع عند السحر ومجالسة الصالحين This topic now the author speaks about pondering over the Quran and in this topic is going to be speaking about some of the pious predecessors, how they were when they used to read the Qur'an and how it used to affect them. Upon beginning his recitation, the reciter must humble himself and strive to complete, to contemplate that which, is, that which he is reciting. When the person wants to read the Qur'an and he, makes, he puts his head to read in the Qur'an, فَلْيَكُنْ شَأْنُهُ الْخُشُوعِ Be a person who comes with humility. وَالتَّدَبُّرُ عِنْدَ الْقِرَاعَةِ And ponder over what you're reading. Don't just let it slip over, just don't recite it, but think. Ask yourself, what does this mean? What is Allah saying here? Naam. Evidence of this is plentiful and so well known that mention is hardly required. The author now goes on to say the evidence is for this, which is to read the Quran with tadabbur and khushur. He said the evidence for this is أكثر من أن تحصر. It is too much for us to restrict it to an amount. Or for us to bring all the evidences for it, it's too much in number. وَأَشْهَرُ وَأَظْهَرُ مِنْ أَنْ تُذْكَرَ And it's too famous and well known for even us to men try to mention it. Indeed, contemplation is the main purpose behind reciting the Qur'an and that which is required of any reciter. The Qur'an's purpose and why it was sent down was what? Why did Allah send the Qur'an down? He sent the Qur'an so it can be pondered on. Not so it can be stuck to the walls. Not so, not so somebody can just uh, listen to it. But the Qur'an was sent down for pondering, to think over it. Naam. Through it, hearts are both open and illuminated. With the Quran, brothers and sisters, وَبِهِ تَنْشَرِحُ الصُّدُورِ Allah opens people's hearts. The heart... Does your body need food? Yes. Your heart needs food. And the heart of your food is the Quran. If you don't give it food, your heart will die. Just like your body will die if you don't nurture it. If you don't take in any supplement and would you call it you don't take in any food صح? would your body die huh? would you die if you don't eat yes the heart dies the same way and the food the supplement that the heart needs is the Quran and that's why you find a lot of people who are suicidal they want to kill themselves they don't know they don't want to live anymore they're stressed anxieties depression everything the reason is because they are distanced from the Qur'an. Wallahi, the ayah is haqiqa. وَمَنْ أَعْرَضَ عَنْ ذِكْرِي فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ The ones who turn away from my remembrance, which is meaning the Qur'an, you turn away from it, فَإِنَّ لَهُ مَعِيشَةً ضَنْكَ You're going to live a hard life. Why are you going to live a hard life? Because you haven't nurtured your body heart. You haven't given it its food. How's it going to move? How's it going to work? Can a car work without oil? Petrol? Can it? 
If you're not seven, it's in the car. Okay, it will run for a while, and then after that, the car will break down. The heart is the same. And that's the moment you see yourself depressed. Suicidal moments. I don't want to live anymore. That moment is what you should know that you haven't been feeding yourself. Does that make sense? Allah says, do they not contemplate on the Qur'an? So do they not ponder on the Qur'an? Do they not ponder on the Qur'an? This question is what? This question is a rhetorical question. So it's a question where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to you what, what ponder on the Qur'an. You're being commanded to ponder on the Qur'an. Naam? And Allah the Almighty says, this is a book that we reveal to you blessed so that they may contemplate it to Allah is saying, I sent a book down for you guys. This book is Mubarak. Mubarak means what? Full of blessings. ayati. So it's verses you can ponder on. The reason why I sent it, li, 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 this is lamu sababiya. Sababu in zalil Quran. The reason why I sent the Quran down was so you can ponder over its verses. And it can be a reminder for those who are smart. Many ahadiths and reports from the pious predecessors exist regarding the importance of contemplating the Quran. This is too much. But let's, say, let's look how some of the Salaf started to ponder on the Quran. And then they took these verses serious. Look how seriously they took it. Huh? It is reported that some among the predecessors would spend the entire night reciting just one verse. Allahu Akbar. All night they will be repeating and reading only one verse. All night just one verse. Why? They were pondering over it. Huh? Contemplating and repeating it over and over until dawn. We're talking about huh? reading it all night until Fajr comes in. Qiyam, Salah. They're in the middle of the Salah, Naam. It is also reported that some would faint while reciting, and others are even reported to have died while reciting and contemplating the glorious Quran. Some of them fainted. They were reading that verse, repeating it, repeating it for Sa'iqah. He fainted. He woke up again heat, sweat, some of them, they died from that recitation. Their heart stopped and they died. Stories now, hey, Fadl. Bahaz ibn Hakim narrates that Zurara ibn Ufa, a noble tabi'i, may Allah have mercy on him, led the dawn prayers and when he reached the verse... <laughs> so Bahaz ibn Hakim is saying Zurara ibn, uh, ibn, uh, ibn Ufa, who is a tabi'i, a noble tabi'i, <coughs> He led them in the Fajr prayer. He led them in what? In the Fajr prayer. Hey, yeah? And when he reached the verse. And he, when he, as he was leading them in the prayer, Zurara led them and he reached Qawluhu Ta'ala. When the, when the trumpet is sounded, that is a day that will be a severe day. Allah says, فَإِذَا نُقِرَ فِي النَّاقُورِ the day in which the trumpet will be blown into it. Allah says, فَذَلِكَ that day when the trumpet is blown. ذَلِكَ يَوْمٌ عَسِيرٌ It will be a hard day. That day would be an extremely hard day when the trumpet is blown and every single body is now heading towards accountability. This is the day when it's hard, Allah says. And something Allah referred to as being hard it's truly hard. If Allah has said it's hard, then it's going to be hard, Wallah. So he read, Zurar ibn, ibn Awfa read this verse, and then what happened? He died and fell to the ground. Kharra mayyitan, he fell on the ground dead. Can somebody kill himself? I don't know, he killed himself like that. In the middle of the salah. He can't kill himself. How can he kill himself? He can't, but the verse hit him so much that he died from it. Hey, yeah? Bahaz further affirmed the incident saying, I was among those who carried him away. Bahaz ibn Hakim said, I took him to Salah. I took him to the, uh, the grave. I carried him on my neck. I was to the Qabr. So yes, he did die from it. 
That's to emphasize to you that this did happen. Now, and why would that happen to them? Is because they knew what this was about. They knew this was about. Ahmed ibn Abi al-Khawari, may Allah be pleased with him, who according to Abu al-Qasim al junaid may Allah be pleased with him, was known as the Rayhan of the Shah, meaning the sweet basil of Damascus, would wail and faint for fear of Allah if the Qur'an was recited in his presence. Ahmad ibn Abi al-Hawari was known as Rayhan of the Shah, as the Imam Abu al-Qasim al junaid said about him. If Qur'an was read to him, he would cry and weep excessively. Naam. Regarding this, Ibn Abi Dawood said that Qasim ibn Uthman al Juri, may Allah be pleased with him, would repudiate Abu al-Hawari for his reaction. Al Juri was a Roman and prominent scholar of Hadith in Damascus and was regarded as superior to, to, to Abu al Hawari in terms of piety and virtue. Abu al, Abu al Jawza, Qais ibn Hatta, and others were also known to have disproved of such conduct. Yeah, so, so the, the, the doings of Ahmad ibn, ibn Abi al-Hawari, his crying was a bit too excessive. So this is rebuking for it. Stop doing that. Don't do this. Because of the noise that he would make and his squeeping and his sound was excessive. So they used to rebuke him for it. But well, look what Nawi said after that. When he brought all of those who told him, who tell him, Abu al-Qasim ibn Uthman al-Ju'i was more virtuous than Ahmad ibn Abi al-Hawari. And also Abu al jawza Qais ibn Bahtar, they were more virtuous and they would stop him from doing that. But look what Nawawi said. I believe that it shouldn't be disapproved of, provided the individual is not feigning such actions and Allah knows best. And Imam al Nawawi said, Wasawabu, the correct opinion to me regarding this is Adam al Inkar. We shouldn't reject this person's action and we shouldn't tell them off. Unless if the person is doing it, Willingly, he's choosing to do this, but if it's not in his control and he's not doing it, it's not in his power. And there's some people when they cry, they 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 cry is too loud. So if it's if it is known that he's not doing it tasannu'an, he's not doing it willingly like that, then there's no reason for him to be told off. The honorable and noble Ibrahim al Khawas, may Allah be pleased with him renowned for his talents and knowledge, explains that there are five remedies for the heart. Um, <coughs> Ibrahim al-Khawas, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that the cures of the heart are five. The cures of the heart are what? Five things are the cures of the heart. Hey, what's the first one? Reciting the Qur'an with contemplation. The first one is to recite the Qur'an bitadabburi. Reciting the Qur'an, pondering. That's the first cure for the heart. Keeping the stomach empty. Keeping your stomach empty means here, reducing on your food intake. The reason is because إِذَا إِذَا امْتَلَأَتِ الْبَطْءِ نَامَتِ الْفِكْرَةِ وَكَفَّتِ الْأَعْضَاءِ عَنِ الْعِبَادَةِ If the stomach gets filled, the mind starts to slow down. And once the mind slows down, the body starts doing no, not much work anymore. So if you eat a lot at night time, you can't pray Qiyamul Layl. So what does Al Imam uh, Al Qahtani say in his Nuniya? He says, "Wakhsha." Uh, he says, "Wakhsha batna kabit taami tasamunan fajusum wahdi al ilmi ghairi simani." He says, "Get rid of eating food. Don't fill your body with too much food. For verily, the flesh and sorry, the body of the, bodies of the people of knowledge is not fat. People of knowledge are not fat and chubby." Huh? They're not big and, 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 and fat. The reason is because they can't tend to go together. But Idalika Imam Shafi'i when he saw Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani. And Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani was naturally chubby. He was extremely big. Allah Mubarak. Are you there? And it's, what's it's shocking is that it was said that Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani used to fast the fasting of Nabi Dawood. Yeah, it was very he used to fast a lot. And he was a sahib of ilm, a man of knowledge, and ilm, a diraya, understanding of the deen. Rahimahullah ta'ala. It was he was well known for his fasting. It's just those type of people when they eat, there's some people, they eat, but it just, it goes to their body straight to it, it shows. If they eat 
something just that day alone the next day it shows and there's some people if they munch all day nothing shows yeah they're eating all day and other people if they just one day if they eat something the next day they start showing on their body and that's how he was Muhammad Hassan al-Shaybani the point being here that Shafi'iyu saw him and remember Shafi'iyu who did he see? Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Shaybani and when he saw him he said to him, La yuflihu sameenun qat. A chubby person will never be, Safiri say this, a chubby person will never be successful in attaining knowledge after Muhammad al Hassan al-Shaybani. Meaning, generally speaking, he's talking about Shafi'i. He means that generally a person who loves food can't generally be a strong student of knowledge. So, because remember, as I said, you can't associate partners with knowledge. You can't do shirk in ilm. Ilm only wants Tawheed. It wants you to do it alone and not associate partners with it. Okay? So, one of the things that causes thickness to the heart is eating too much food. The food that the people eat, it can affect your heart. And there are some people when they become depressed and when they become sad, they eat food too much. Crisp, I'm stressed. They sit, sit, sit in bed all day, they just open chicken and chips, crisps, burger, flip burger. Yeah, all day munching. What are you doing? Just just eat, Akhi. I'm just ordering something, Wallahi. And just all day, delivery coming to the house. Huh? Some people are like that. They get depressed and they eat too much. It's sickness of the heart. Eating too much what? Walidharika Wallahi, brothers and sisters. If a person stays a very healthy life, it will, it will. As an individual, if you cut off on food, you feel very light. And it will psychologically make you energized. The day you eat nasty food, that whole day you feel different, you grumpy, you just... So, it does affect your ibadah, it affects everything and it affects your heart like that as well. But if a person works out, the person eats healthy food for instance. Like for me example, I don't eat healthy food but I don't eat much. I cut down on eating. I avoid eating. So that's, it, works, it makes me feel good in that, in that regard. But if you feel like you're going to eat and you can't stop yourself from eating, then cut down on what you're eating. Cut down on what you're eating. And if you feel like even cutting down is a mushkila, my, my mind won't let me do that. Then get things that are good for you. Some of the ulama I saw, they used to eat, they eat nuts, a lot of nuts. Just get a lot of nuts, you know those raisins, those little new nuts. Just put them in a bowl and just eat that a lot. Some people just like their mouth moving all the time. Just how Allah created them. They just like munching something. You like it? Don't turn it into a burger, but use, use it as nuts. They're not the KP salted nuts, no. I'm talking about real dry nuts. Get dates, eat dates. One of the things that's good for a student is a lot of water. To drink a lot. Anyways, khala il batri. Things that are good for your body. Standing in Standing in prayer during the night. Also, the other third one is min layl, night prayer. Night prayer is what? Look how the Sheikh mentioned your butt, your stomach being empty and qiyamul layl. If you eat too much, you won't be able to pray qiyamul layl. They won't won't happen. Some people say to you, Akhi, I always try to eat, pray qiyamul layl. Yeah, I, I can tell you, you're not going to pray qiyamul layl. Look what you got in your hand. Look at the food that you got with you right now. Of course, you're not going to wake up for qiyamul layl. You eat. You eat a lot of food. Sah. And also the issue of khala al batni which is to keep your stomach empty, there's a if it passes Maghrib, don't eat anymore much. Eat very lightly. Huh? Don't eat heavy after Maghrib. Some people are like that. If they eat a lot after Maghrib, that whole day they sleep. Supplicating earnestly in the middle of the night. Then the other one is at tadarru' in the sahar. Midnight, 
getting up and crying to Allah and begging Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, humiliating yourself from Him. And keeping the companionship of the pious. Wallah, Allahu Akbar. Sitting with righteous people, your heart will grow. This is the cure of the heart. And you who, what type of friend do you sit with? What type of friend do you, you sit with? A friend that has three things. Anyone who doesn't have three, three things from you, don't have three things with them, do not sit with them and don't spend a split second with them. Are you there? If he has one of these three, sit with that person. Number one, you benefit from them. You benefit. Whether it even be, even be dunya, even if it's dunya, that you're benefiting from them, sit with them. There's benefit in this person, right? The second one is that they are benefiting from you. Sit with those people that are benefiting from you. And the last one is when you're both benefiting from each other. As much as he's benefiting from you, you're benefiting. So it, three, it goes three ways. You're benefiting me. I'm benefiting you. We're benefiting each other. Those are the three. Anyone who doesn't fall under any of those three is a waste of time. Don't spend time with him. Are you going to benefit from me? No. Are you going to benefit me? No. Are we going to benefit each other? No. Why are you sitting with me? You don't say it like that, but you don't spend time with that person. You leave those type of people. So, that person is not a righteous person to sit with. Or it's not a, a person of benefit for you. So, your time, you spend it with people who have one of those three. One of those? One of those three. Then the author Rahimahullah says, Faslun fi istihbabi tardidi al ayati li tadabbur kad qaddamna fi al fasli qablahu al hatha ala al tadabbur wa bayani mawqi'ihi wa al taathur al salafi bih wa rawayna an abi dharrin radiyallahu anhu qal qam al nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam bi ayatin yurajidua hatta asbah wa al ayah إن تعذبهم فإنهم عبادك رواه النسائي وابن ماجة وعن تميم الداري رضي الله عنه أنه كرر هذه الآية حتى أصبح أم حسب الذين اجترحوا السيئات أن نجعلهم كالذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات سواء محياهم الآية وعن عباد بن حمزة قال دخلت على أسماء رضي الله عنها وهي تقرأ فمن الله علينا ووقعنا عذاب السموم فوقفت عندها فجعلت تعيدها وتدعو فطال علي ذلك فذهبت إلى السوق فقضيت حاجتي ثم رجعت وهي تعيدها وتدعو وروت هذه القصة عن عائشة رضي الله عنها وردد ابن مسعود رضي الله تعالى عنه رب زدني علما وردد سعيد بن جبير رضي الله عنه واتقوا يوما ترجعون فيه إلى الله وردد أيضا فسوف يعلمون إذ الأغلال في أعناقهم الآية وردد أيضا ما غرك بربك الكريم وكان الضحاك إذا تلا لهم من فوقهم ظلل من النار ومن تحتهم ظلل رددها إلى السحر سكشن Reciting a verse repeatedly for the purpose of contemplation is recommended. This is now, are you allowed to go over one ayah so many times and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and repeat it and say it so many times? This is what he talks about, yeah? In the preceding section, we mentioned the necessity of encouraging the contemplation of the Qur'an and explained its importance. Naam, so the author says in the previous chapter, what did we speak about? The importance of pondering over the Qur'an and understanding its position and the effect that it had in the pious predecessor's eyes. Now, an impact on the pious predecessors. It is also narrated that Abu Dhar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Prophet وسلم, once spent the whole night repeating a single verse until dawn, and the verse was, if you punish them, then verily they are your slaves. 
Abi Dhar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said that the Prophet stood up repeating one verse, kept repeating and repeating until dawn. And the ayah was in tu'adhibhum, oh Allah, if you punish them, fa'innahum ibaduka, they are your slaves. If you punish them, they are your slave. The Prophet recited this verse so many times from his qiyam until dawn. He was reading it. Naam. It is narrated that Tamim al Dari may Allah be pleased with him recited the following verse repeatedly until dawn. Or do those who earn evil deeds think that we should hold them equal with those who believe and do righteous good deeds? This ayah also was an ayah which uh, a Tamim al Dari, the noble companion, he kept repeating, which is Am Hasib al Ladina Jitarahu Sayyat. Ijtarahu means a iktasabu. Do they think the ones who have gained evil? And Naj'alahum, that we're going to make them equal to what? Kaladina Amanu Amanu Salahati, like the ones who have done righteous deeds. Sawa and Mahayahum wa Mamatu. Do you really think that's what Allah is going to do? That the criminals, the wrongdoers, the atheists, the agnostics, they're going to be the same as those who believe in Allah, believe in the Day of Judgment. The good doers, they're not going to be the same. So he kept repeating this verse. This noble companion Abu Ruqayyah, maybe when he also needs Dariya radiallahu ta'ala anhu. Abbad ibn Hamza states, I entered upon Asma, may Allah be pleased with her, while she was reciting the verse, and so Allah bestowed his grace upon us and saved us from the torment of the fire. She then paused on that verse and repeated it over and over again, supplicating to Allah, and she continued to do this for some time. I then went to the market, took care of my business, and came back to find that she was still repeating the same verse and supplicating. This story was also narrated from Aisha radiallahu anha. Aisha was narrated from this story is that Asma radiallahu ta'ala anha she recited the ayah فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ Oh Allah, you have favored us and you have saved us from the punishment of the hellfire, the torment of the hellfire. And this is when the believers enter Jannah. This is the dua that they're going to make. And then Asma, a wife, a woman, a noble individual who was righteous, she kept repeating this and repeating this and repeating this and thinking and pondering and she was saying in this ayah when she read it, Oh Allah, save us from the hellfire. Oh Allah, take us to your Jannah. So in the Qiyam, it's a Sunnah to stop and make Dua. And to come back to the verse and make Dua. Because the Prophet ﷺ, when he came to verses that were talking about Jannah, he would ask for Jannah. And the t verses that come, uh, that were talking about the hellfire, he would seek refuge in Allah from the hellfire. This is also, and then this uh, Abad ibn Hamza, he said, I went to the market. I came back. She was still in that position reading the ayah. فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَا عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ She was still repeating it. This is also narrated from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. That Urwa ibn, ibn Zubair. Urwa. Urwa saw her. And he left her in that position. And he came back and she was still in the same position. Aisha radiallahu anha. Abu Naim ibn Nusayyid al-Hilyat al-Awliya al-Tabakat al-Asfiyah. Naam? Ibn Mas'ud is reported to have repeatedly recited the verse and saying, O oh my Lord, increase me in knowledge. Naam. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud kept repeating the ayah, Wa qur rabbi zidni ilma. Oh Allah, increase me in what? In knowledge. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, an alim, a scholar of Islam, man with great knowledge, she, he, even then he was saying, Oh Allah, increase me in knowledge. He was repeating that in the Salah. Sa'id ibn Jubayr will repeat the verse, and fear the day when you shall be returned to Allah, and also the verse, and soon they will know when iron collars are placed around their necks. He also repeated, O oh mankind, what has made you careless regarding your Lord, the most generous? And the Haq would repeat the following verse until dawn, wherever he would come upon it. They shall have layers of fire above them and layers of fire below them. All these noble individuals, Sa'id ibn Jubair, he would recite and repeat these verses. He would read, The day that they will know, the day of judgment, when the chains are placed on their necks. What is it that's deceiving you from your Lord? What makes you think you're safe? You see, Dahaq ibn Muzahim. He would recite the ayah, لَهُمْ مِنْ فَوْقِهِمْ ظُلَلٍ Above Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is placed over them clouds. 
that are going to pour fire over them. وَمِنْ تَحْتِهِمْ ظُلَلْ And under them as well. And he kept repeating this until the dawn. All of them were reading it with pondering and thinking over it. And remember the reason why they were crying and they were sad and they were repeating this is because they were not reading the Qur'an like many of us do. Many of us read the Qur'an on the grounds of what? That it's what? That it's talking to somebody else. The reason we read and the reason they were reading was different. They were reading it because the Qur'an was something that they, that, that they felt was talking to them. And that the Qur'an was speaking to them. Like when they will read this ayah, فَسَوْفَ They will come to know When the chains are on their necks, Sa'id ibn Jubair was thinking that this is him. Uh, and when Allah's verse came down, وَاتَّقُوا يَوْمًا uh, Be conscious of Allah the day, a day يَوْمًا تُرْجَعُونَ فِيهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ The day you will turn back to your Lord. He wasn't saying, oh, the disbelievers need to think about that. Huh? No, he's thinking this is him. Uh, so when a person starts to read the Quran in belief that this is talking to him, it's addressing him, it is him that's being spoken to, the perspective changes. The way you look at the whole Quran becomes different and it will affect you more. It will really affect you. But if you read the Quran as a third person, then na'am it's not going to affect you. Inshallah ta'ala we're going to conclude there bi al kareem. Um, anything which I have said that was wrong or incorrect is from me and Shaitan and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallah, may be hamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illallah, astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayhi.